80s, when my children were little, there was a new author that became, just started to become well known. His name is Robert Munch. And he began to write stories with surprise endings. The Paper Bag Princess was one of such tales. Now Elizabeth was a beautiful princess, and she had beautiful princess clothes and a lovely castle, and she was going to marry a prince named Ronald. Unfortunately, a dragon smashed down her castle, burnt all her clothes with fiery breath, and carried off Prince Ronald. Elizabeth looked around, and she put on the only thing she could find, an old paper bag. And then she went off to <coughs> rescue Ronald. Now without violence or any kind of force, she was able to trick the dragon into falling asleep. And she freed Ronald. And he took one look at her and declared that her hair was a mess and it smelled like smoke and her clothes were a disgrace and she should just come back when she began to look like a princess. Elizabeth voiced her evaluation of Ronald. Your clothes are pretty and your hair is quite slick. But you look like a prince, but you are a bum. <laughs> the book ends with, and they didn't get married after all. Yes, the first time I read that story, I laughed right out loud. Because for someone who grew up on fairy tales in which the helpless princess was either awakened or discovered or rescued by the prince, wh whom she then went on to marry and live happily ever after with, I found these books really invigorating. The strong agency given to the main roles and the twist of events made children and those reading the books to the children feel strong enough to endure life's sharp U-turns and bumps. Mark's book does not have a happily ever after ending either. Rather, it ends with a surprise and a challenge. The women were going to the tomb. They were going to a place of loss and pain in order to perform a last tender act of mercy. It's not a task that they went, were going to relish, but it was one, a woman's task that they were very familiar with. They were prepared. They had an early start on their day, and their main concern was about how to move that rock blocking the tomb so that they could go in to anoint the body. But when they arrived, their plans changed abruptly. The rock was already rolled aside, and when they entered the cave, they saw a young man sitting there in glowing white robes. And like all angels, what does he say? Don't be afraid. And like all people encountering an angel, the three women were taken aback. They were astonished. They were afraid. The young man tells them, Jesus who is crucified is not here, and a pile of linen is sitting there where Jesus' body should be. All of their assumptions about the immovability of large rocks and the finality of death have been shattered. The angelic youth instructs the women to tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus has gone ahead to Galilee. He says, they'll see him there exactly as Jesus had foretold. They had gone towards that tomb with a set of assumptions about death and grief and closure. But what they found there just shattered their reality. Faced with the naked power of a God who can move rocks and raises the dead, they did what most regular people will do. They ran. They didn't just meander home in wonder. They exploded out of that tomb, wide-eyed, trem trembling, feet slapping the sand in double time. That's the final image that Mark offers us, one of fear and amazement and motion. Scripture implies that they were stunned into silence. 
They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid, says Mark 16, 8. And yet they must have told, or there wouldn't be a story at all. If it happened in our day, I bet someone would have captured that empty tomb and the people running away on a camera phone and uploaded it to video on YouTube before they even got home to tell the disciples. Their assumptions about life and death have been turned on end, and it would make them question what other assumptions, what about wisdom and power, wisdom and folly, or power and weakness? It makes me think of that advertisement for Prego spaghetti sauce, the one in which the woman who has always purchased ragu does a taste test, finds out that Prego is so much better, and then she flashes back to what other lousy decisions she's made in life, like um, being a disco chick. The empty tomb and the message he has gone ahead to Galilee <coughs> presents followers with a challenge. If the tomb is empty, then the dream is not dead, and the reign of God is closer than anybody thinks. The mission is not complete. There is work to be done. Jesus is on the loose in the world, and so they didn't just sit down and have a cup of tea and think about what they were going to do, and they didn't form a committee and, and negotiate a plan. They ran. They got to move on. This ending sends the followers back to Galilee to where Jesus first told them about the good news and where the disciples were first called into action. I've got to admit, though, the first few times that I read through this ending, I found it unsettling and incomplete. And there are 12 more verses in the book of Mark. But scholars agree that they were not written by Mark, that they were added later by someone else who also felt the story was incomplete or inadequate. They just didn't like the tension of that original ending. What I have found in this ending, this ending that doesn't include a physical appearance of Christ, does not include a grand commissioning. It does not include an ascension into heaven. What I found in this ending is a direction to a new beginning and to a hope in a promised regathering of the community of believers. When I consider the empty tomb, I feel shock and dread. My assumptions are challenged. The status quo is beginning to change right before my eyes. It's like learning that the United Methodist Church has been on a downward trend for 40 years. It's like finding out there were no children for Sunday school program or that we're now part of a two-point charge. And on a personal level, it's like losing your job or facing mounting credit card debt or experiencing the death of a loved one. There's a big, empty, scary hole in your life. Yet, at the same time, we see the power of God in that empty tomb. Jesus has been raised. He's loose in the world. The stone is what rolled away, not so that Jesus could get out, but so that we could get in and see that he was gone. In the middle of our big, scary holes in our lives, we'll be directed to new beginnings. We will find hope in our community of believers. For example, the United Methodist work church is working on a restructuring plan <coughs> that they'll confirm during conference, which is just 16 days from now. They'll settle on new legislation that will govern us for the next four years, and they're going to move ahead with that vital congregations initiative. And through this, this gathering of believers, we hope the church will be strengthened for God's work. Now we can't see the future, but the whole lies not in knowing where we're going exactly, but go knowing who is leading the way. Jesus is leading. Jesus will lead us to the correct work for our community in a way that will draw people into discipleship and engage them through our one ministry in two locations at Delmont and in Severin. Personally, I've learned the very things that I've been afraid of, like changes in my health or a job loss, 
actually end up becoming new avenues to new adventures. A job change brought Frank and I to this area. And here we found a powerful community of believers. And it was here that I began to follow God's call to ministry. This kind of empty tomb is frightening. But when we burst out of the tomb to find new beginnings and the strength from other believers, it is like the angel telling us, you will see him in Galilee exactly as he said. Back in mid-February, as we prepared for Lent, at the beginning of our journey to hope, I painted a picture of what this congregation would look like if we could truly call it a vital con congregation. A place where young people and those young in faith would grow in discipleship and where folks would come to worship and feel the Holy Spirit and leave refreshed and renewed. I said at that time that if we opened ourselves to living this new vision, and if Delmont was a strong and healthy in the spirit, then on Easter today, we would be able to celebrate a baptism, or at least renew our own baptisms, and we would welcome new members into our congregation, I predicted that we would not only be able to ce celebrate today the risen Lord, but that we would also have been midwives to a new birth, to lives transformed. This morning, as we burst from the tomb to join a living, resurrected Jesus in, loose in the world, we will be renewing our baptisms. Now, I do it as a sign of returning to Galilee, of returning to the intensity of my first commitment to Christ. And I hope you will, too. And we're going to be welcoming Andy Conley into new membership. And we're going to celebrate the birth of our new fledgling youth group. All of these are signs of lives transformed. We have been truly blessed. Mark's book doesn't have a happy ending. It stops unexpectedly. We are left wanting more. We are given the surprise of an empty tomb and the challenge of new beginning and the hope drawn from the community of believers, the church. It's up to us to live and write the next chapter. So let's go. Let's burst out of this tomb, man. Let's just get going. Amen.